Um, all right, hey everyone, I'm Nick Warshaw. I was the co-chair of this organization last year, and you'll hear from Alex Walker in a second. Just want to tell you a little about American Constitution Society. Um, Sandra Fluke is on her way, by the way. I'm sure you guys noticed she's walking. She just called me five seconds ago. Um, so the American Constitution Society is the progressive legal organization on campus. We believe in an expansive vision for the Constitution and hold events on a variety of topics, including this one, including reproductive rights, choice. But uh, last year we had events ranging from mass incarceration, to the city attorney talking about justice, public defender here, when the event, we'll continue to have events on inequality and the law. Um, and so hold a series of events and bring speakers to campus to sort of uh, fill what we think is a little bit of a void on sort of what we, how law students can take action um, through the legal system and the political process and make uh, a progressive vision of the Constitution a reality in policy throughout the California and the United States um, broadly. Uh, and then to introduce this panel, uh, Alex Walker, our co-chair of ACS. 50 years ago, the Supreme Court ruled that the Constitution protected the right to privacy in the case of Griswold v. Connecticut. In a 72 decision, they struck, they struck down a law that prohibited any married couple from using any drug or instrument for the purpose of preventing contraception. Griswold laid the foundation for the right to abortion. However, as we have all seen in the news recently, there is still a long way to go in the fight for women's reproductive rights. This summer, an anti-abortion organization released a number of videos that were being secretly recorded with the officials of Planned Parenthood. The videos have sparked pro-life politicians to fight to pull Planned Parenthood's funding and sparked concern of another government shutdown. Today, we have three women's rights activists and lawyers here to speak to you all about the fight for women's reproductive rights. So I'm going to introduce the panel. So first, we have Christine Pelosi who has an impressive background in public policy and politics as an attorney, author, and activist. She was the executive director and platform chair of the California Democratic Party, a deputy city attorney, and assistant DA for the city of San Francisco. She served on the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development Special Counsel in the Clinton Gore administration and chief of staff to, chief of staff to U.S. Representative John Tierney. She served as the Interim Executive Director of the Young Democrats of America and is currently the Chairwoman to the California Democratic Party's Women's Caucus. She has been an elected member of the Democratic National Committee for 19 years. She earned her Bachelor's at Georgetown School of Foreign Service and her JD from UC Hastings. Professor, professor Michelle Goodwin is a Chancellor's Professor of Law at UC Irvine. Her research concerns the role of law in the promotion and regulation of medicine, science, and biotechnology. She teaches and researches in areas of constitutional law, property, biotechnology, bioethics, and cultural politics. Her scholarship defines new ways of thinking about supply, demand, and access to sophisticated medical technologies, spanning genetics to organ transplantation, assisted reproductive technology, and creating families. She received her BA in Sociology, Anthropology, and African Languages and Literature from the University of Wisconsin, her JD from Boston College of Law, and her LLM from the University of Wisconsin, and was a postdoctoral scholar at Yale. She serves on the Board of Directors for the American Civil Liberties Union, and also serves on uh, the Planned Parenthood Board of Orange. And should I wait for Sandra to Maybe. Maybe. Okay, so our third <laughs> um, panelist is an attorney and public rights act interest activist. She received her BA from Cornell and her JD from Georgetown. She helped draft, negotiate, and pass pieces of legislation for various public interest causes. <clears throat> While she was a law student at Georgetown, she spoke out against the hardship female law students had to endure because birth control was not covered by the student health insurance plan. She was invited by Democrats to speak at the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee concerning the Affordable Care Act, but was ultimately blocked by Republicans. A week later, the House Democratic Steering and Policy Committee convened a meeting to allow her to speak. After testifying, conservative radio hosts used sexist slurs to describe her desire to receive women's um, health care. She is currently a social, social justice and legislative advocate for the California State Director of Voices for Progress. And there she is. <laughs> so I'm going to turn it over to the board. Thank you guys so Thank much. You so much. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for having us here. I also want to um, thank Nick Warshaw, my good friend, for uh, helping us put this together. And when we 
thought about coming down to Los Angeles. I am a Giants fan, so I'm a little bit and be nice to me, Dr. Fan. Um, we thought that um, when we tried to find a date for the fall, we thought what could be better than the first Monday in October? Because the Supreme Court is back and uh, they are in session and our privacy rights will be debated. And once again, millions of women across America will see a handful of powerful men, and luckily, three fabulous women, <laughs> debating our rights in the pub, our private rights in the public square. And so as we look at Griswold and we consider where we were 50 years ago when the director of the Planned Parenthood Federation of Connecticut was arrested and convicted for providing birth control information to 10 married women. Family planning advice, what to do in the context of their married lives and where we were last week watching the head of Planned Parenthood, Cecile Richards, being grilled by now what turns out to be a candidate for Speaker of the House of Representatives for several hours uh, about some uh, private issues. We know that there's work for us to do to make sure that 50 years from now it is not our children, your children, and my children debating and fighting this issue. It's one thing, I think, for us to recognize that we will always have debate in this country. There will always be debates about individual rights and liberties. The question is whether they will be rendered illegal, whether we're going to be going forward or whether we're going to be going backwards. And there's no better person to start explaining uh, that to us than Professor Michelle Goodwin. So I want her to begin by giving us uh, a, a legal overview of where we are right now, Griswold at 50. What, what rights do we have, <laughs> Professor, and what rights uh, do we risk losing? So um, technically, uh, women have a, a right to access, and men, uh, contraception and also abortion, but those rights have been dramatically burdened. Uh, and it is a true slippery slope that we are on now. I'll give you an example. In Burwell v. Hobby Lobby, it's the first time the court says that a, a corporation can have religious interest. Uh, it's a case that involved uh, Hobby Lobby and a few other uh, corporations that said, uh, well, we are opposed uh, to the contraceptive mandate and we're opposed to certain contraceptions because those contraceptions are really abortifacants. Um, this was absolutely wrong. Uh, there are two big problems with the case. One is that the court said, well, this is just a closely held corporation, uh, so no big deal. But if you check with the IRS, over 90% of the corporations in the United States are actually closely held corporations. So it's not a ma and pa shop. This basically means any given corporation can say, oh, well, today, um, we don't believe in contraception, uh, we don't believe in vaccines, we don't believe in any number of things, and so we don't have to provide those services. The second thing that's quite problematic in terms of how the court is dealing with issues of contraception and abortion is that they are misinterpreting science. Even in the Hobby Lobby case where the employer said, look, these contraceptions are really like abortifacants. They cause a, a abortion, which is the same thing that some politicians have said. It's absolutely wrong. What Plan B does and other kinds of contraception like that is that they simply stop ovulation. And so here is basic sex ed, which a lot of folks don't get, and that's also one of the problems here, which is that in order for there to be an abortificant that works, you have to have a fertilized egg. You have to have an embryo that has developed and that has embedded in the uterus. If there's no ovulation, there isn't even an egg. There's no egg, there's no sperm. It's impossible, right? So where we are today is that there are rights that have been, um, that, that have ins been instantiated by the Supreme Court, but they've been incredibly burdened. And if you'll allow me just one more moment, um, those burdens now are leading also to criminal pr prosecution of women. And that is to say that the Supreme Court said in Casey 
that while it could be permissible that some states could design certain laws that would burden a woman's right to have an abortion, such as a 24-hour waiting period, would be okay, but not okay if she has to get her husband's permission. The problem now is that in some states, they have now designed 72-hour waiting periods, and that does not include weekends or holidays. Did any of you know that for a Medicaid-funded abortion in Iowa, the governor has to approve it? Can you imagine that the governor has to sign off on your medical care and treatment? In the state of Michigan, insurance cannot be used at all for an abortion, which means it has to come out of pocket. And finally, in the cast of the types of burdens uh, that have befallen women in this domain, mandatory vaginal ultrasounds. I mean, can you imagine if uh, someone before they received their gun had to have their, uh, a mandatory ultrasound um, in their gut? Or can you imagine before someone um, can receive a, uh, an operation because he's having a heart attack that he's forced to listen to some unscientific dribble and to watch it on a screen someplace and that he has to come back five days later before the state would allow him to have his operation. No, that would be thought of as absolute lunacy. But this is what we subject women to. And so it's no surprise that in some states there, such as Mississippi, there's only one abortion clinic left. Well, with that as a landscape, let us turn to our next speaker. As some of you may know, my mother is Nancy Pelosi. and the House Democratic leader, and she called me up a couple of years ago and she said, did you see our law student? <laughs> Sandra, right before you got here, you were being, uh, had a lovely introduction, and among other things, they talked about how uh, when Sandra was a law student at Georgetown, she came to talk to the Congress at the invitation of the House Democrats on the Government Reform and Oversight Committee to discuss the issue of the Affordable Care Act and the issue of access to contraception. The Republicans didn't let her speak. A week later, the Democrats did. So my mom called and said, did you see our law student? What was she great? It's unbelievable. Well, apparently a lot of people saw our law student and she quickly became America's law student, uh, a role that she hadn't quite prepared for, however, stepped into with great grace in the face of really ugly and vile attack. So nobody knows better the landscape in which young women in particular um, have to operate in the public sphere than our next speaker. So I wanted her to tell us uh, a little bit of her story, if she, if she would like, and also to specifically answer the question about Griswold. What are the progeny of Griswold and how does that affect reproductive justice rights in America? Sandra? Absolutely. Um, well, first of all, because I'm speaking to an audience of law students, I would think carefully about whether or not you think that's the right path to follow, volunteering to testify uh, before a House committee. Um, it was not necessarily the best course in terms of my final semester grades in law school, um, but I had a really good excuse for why I was cum laude and not magna cum laude for my mother, which was, I'm sorry, Mom, but Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> But it, it was actually an incredible experience organizing on the law school campus in Georgetown. And of course, this wasn't just me. This was a, a whole group of students and professors working together. And we uh, looked at all different approaches to try to make sure that we had uh, coverage of contraception on the student insurance. We looked at comparable law schools around the country. Catholic and Jesuit law schools examined their policies. Uh, we looked at whether or not we should litigate. Uh, we considered legislation. We wrote comments to HHS as part of their Affordable Care Act uh, regulations that they were in the process of creating. So in, in summary, I would just say find something you're really passionate about, whether it's something here on campus or in the community in Los Angeles, and come together and actually start working on it. Put the skills that you're gaining in class right now to use because it, there was nothing about my law school career that I value more than the time sitting around in the cafeteria and saying, well, okay, I remember how to do uh, a memo on this. I remember how to research this and putting it to use in a way that we felt could improve the lives of our, our fellow students. So I encourage you to look for a project like that that you're passionate about and to not necessarily be thrust into the national spotlight during your final semester. <laughs> 
Those are my two pieces of advice. Um, but to, to speak to Griswold, uh, the thing that I find so profound and, and inspiring about Griswold is how many other areas of social justice it touches. Because we tend to think of this as a reproductive rights case. This is about birth control. This is about contraception. But really, this is the beginning of finding the right to privacy in our Constitution. And of course, that led to Roe v. Wade. But that also led to cases like Loving v. Virginia, which allowed interracial marriages that had been previously uh, illegal in certain states made that unconstitutional. It's also the basis, of course, for all of the gay marriage cases that we've seen since then. So it's one of the ways in which, for me as a social justice attorney and someone who works, works on all of these types of issues, to see how interconnected they are, how much this is all the same fight when it all comes back to this right to privacy. And unfortunately, I think we're seeing this playing out in some other ways uh, as well. So of course, folks are probably following the Kim Davis situation, the clerk who uh, doesn't want to grant marriage licenses to same-sex couples in her state and is refusing to do so on the basis of her religious beliefs. We've seen things like the Hobby Lobby cases that were just being discussed. There are, in state after state, issues around individual pharmacists or individual doctors who don't want to give out a birth control prescription or a Plan B emergency contraception prescription or don't want to provide an abortion sometimes even in cases where that woman's life is in danger and there aren't other providers in the area. And all of this is coming down to the same types of arguments about one person's religious beliefs versus the rights of a community to access care, medical care, or marriage. And it just highlights for me that these are the same fights over and over again. They're the same fights we had during the civil rights era when individual uh, hotel owners or restaurant owners said, I don't want to serve that person, and that's because of my religion, and I want to be able to have the right to not do so in my private business. So it's very important for those of us who believe in these causes, and I think for attorneys especially, to see these connections and think about how we litigate around them, how we legislate around them, so that we're all standing together and not opening loopholes that are going to, that are going to cause huge problems for other movements. That sort of makes sense. I'm pulling together a lot of big concepts. Not if you're with me. Okay. We're with you. Good. Uh, one of, actually, that leads us right into our next topic because one of the things that actually Professor Goodman and I talked about Friday and we've both written about is this element of criminalizing uh, women's choices, but also criminalizing women because of what society or, in particular, lawmakers see as uh, inappropriate attentiveness to uh, the child that they're carrying. Uh, to give an example, I wrote a, I wrote a piece actually um, a couple of years ago, my daughter's fifth birthday, about uh, the experience I had in the 48-hour labor um, that included my asserting my legal right against an emergency cesarean. Turns out she didn't need one, and we didn't have one and comparing my situation as a white, privileged lawyer to that of a poor African-American woman in New Jersey who also asserted her legal right against what turned out to be an unnecessary cesarean, only in her instance, it was later used by a family court judge as evidence of lack <coughs> of care for her child. And so when we look at for example, some of the rules that were developed around the war on drugs that said we don't want, we want to, we want to punish uh, women who are drinking or doing drugs while they are pregnant because we feel that that endangers uh, the, the child that they are carrying. Are there then later consequences that impact other women? For example, right now the spotlight is on Planned Parenthood and wanting to get the records of everybody who goes into a Planned Parenthood for some sort of counseling. And not only the records, the fact that you might have gone in, but the, the substance of what you may have said. But that is designed by people whose goal is to preclude Planned Parenthood from recommending pregnancy termination. But what if you went into a so-called pregnancy crisis center? even the fact that it's called a crisis center, which is designed towards 
not giving you any advice at all about abortion, but is designed towards adoption or other ways to carry the baby to term. What if, in the context of going to a self-proclaimed pro-life pregnancy crisis center, you said some things about how you felt about being pregnant, and that was used against you. And that was used against you. So we have to understand that it isn't just the fact that after the elections of 2010, subsequent legislatures introduced over 1,100 pieces of legislation designed at limiting women's access to abortion and women's health choices. But also, those choices, though originally perhaps designed to go after Planned Parenthood, could also have an effect on women who describe themselves as pro-life and actually go to centers that are designed to help them carry their babies to term. So we need to look more broadly at maternal health. And I, I wanted uh, both uh, Sandra and Michelle to comment on that. Michelle, first, you have something in mind uh, looking at the whole penumbra of maternal health issues, and I wonder if you could preview that for sure. us. Sure. Well, you know, first let me <clears throat> pick up on the, the thread that, that you began with, because I think it's really important to hit home what has happened. So first, that is to say that African American women and Latina women have been the canaries in the coal mine. And unfortunately, some of the slippage that we see, the 1,100 pieces of legislation more anti-abortion and anti-contraceptive uh, legislation proposed in the last couple years than in the 30 years prior. Where we've lost some of the battle is the fact that organizations lost their sisterhood with black women and Latina women. In the 1980s, there were black women and Latina women being arrested for having miscarriages and for having stillbirths. It was, again, based on shaky science, no science, in fact, and because some of those cases were later overturned after women had spent five, nine, ten years in prison having been pressured to take plea deals. You can imagine the circumstance. Poor woman has a miscarriage. You are in law school. My work is at the intersection of law and medicine. The body, a pregnancy is technically parasitic. The body tries to, to get rid of it. I mean, it tries to do it uh, right after conception and, and continues. So uh, stillbirths happen. Miscarriages happen. It's something that's very hard for people to reconcile, but it does happen. But imagine if you're poor and a prosecutor says, we know why you miscarried. And we know why, because your doctors told us and released your medical information to us that you thought was confidential, that at some point during your pregnancy, you took an illicit drug. Now let me flag one thing for you, and that is researchers in Boston who have conducted at BU the longest study on maternal use of prescription medications during pregnancy show that the more educated you are and white uh, and wealthy, the more likely that you're using cocktails of prescription medications during pregnancy. And we're talking about Demerol, Oxycontin, and others. But in the 1980s, poor black women were being arrested for saying that, yes, I took a hit of something during my pregnancy. Well, when organizations fail to come to their aid or to see that as a reproductive rights issue, well, of course, then those women became the canaries in the coal mine because now there are white women who are threatened with arrest for refusing to have a C-section or threatened with arrest for falling down the steps, such as the case of Christine Taylor in Iowa. Falls down the steps in her house, goes to the hospital to make sure the pregnancy is okay, is asked by the nurse, well, at any time were you actually confused about this pregnancy or maybe thought about having an abortion? And she said, oh, yeah, my husband left me. He's in Maryland. I'm here in Iowa, so I thought about it. But now I'm happy to have my pregnancy. She never even got home before police surrounded her car and dragged her out. She was in jail for three days. Bebe Shui, a couple years ago in Indiana, I was an expert witness in her case. She tried to commit suicide after her boyfriend left her in a parking lot, threw some money at her. Uh, and so she went home and tried to kill herself by eating five packets of rat poison, charged with first degree murder because the prosecutor said, well, this really wasn't about trying to kill yourself, which is not illegal in Indiana. And in, in Indiana, you can try to kill yourself. But he said, instead, this is just about trying to kill your fetus. 
charged with first degree murder and had he been successful, she would have served at least 45 years behind bars. Parvi Patel very recently also had a stillbirth essentially she, in fact, will be in jail for 20 years unless her case is overturned. And there are a number of other of these that have taken place across the country. And so as we look at this on a global scale, we have to understand, one, the connection from the past to the present. And the other thing that we have to be mindful of and that you're flagging right now, Christine, and that is the fact that this era, this period of ignoring what was happening with these poor women of color, instantiated doctors as serving as quasi-agents for the state. So what used to be, my doctor's my doctor. I can tell my doctor's things to help me out. South Carolina, some of you have probably covered uh, the Charleston uh, case there where the hospital set up a dragnet and arrested dozens of black women who came in and who had tested positive for some illicit drug. They had a direct pipeline to police and to prosecutors. In my research, I've gone all around the country. I've spoken with prosecutors in Alabama. They've told me they've got a direct hotline from doctors who call them the moment that a woman tests dirty. And what's very interesting about this is that there is a class differentiation because the people that they're calling about are poor women who've taken an illicit drug. They're not calling about the wealthy, white, educated women who are being prescribed essentially the same things that poor women are taking because they're having difficulty during pregnancy. And that gets finally to the point that you're making about privacy and information, even for women who happen to be pro-life. The reality is that when the poorest amongst us, who are the weakest and mo most vulnerable, suffer these kinds of attacks, we all become vulnerable up the lane from that. When doctors say, look, all I have to do is get on the phone and call 911 and they're gonna be here and respond, today it may be that poor woman, but tomorrow, and we are living in the tomorrow, it's people who are in this very room. And I think one thing that, that really, a question that rises from those comments is, how does this connect to availability and access to services? Because if you feel like you can't talk to your doctor, and rightfully you feel that way, that you can't be honest with your doctor about the fact that you're feeling suicidal or that you're not happy about this pregnancy, then where does a woman turn? So we're all very familiar with the, the important point that when you make abortions illegal, women die because they will turn somewhere and it won't be safe for anyone involved. But I think we're now actually seeing something even worse, which is that without making abortion illegal, we've made abortion and many reproductive health care services inaccessible and unsafe to access. So if you feel so paranoid, and rightfully so, about talking to your doctor about these issues, you're not seeking help. If there is nowhere in your state where you can go that you really trust the provider to talk to them, you don't seek the kinds of health care that you need. And so there are a whole litany of consequences of things like putting Planned Parenthood out of business, of defunding Planned Parenthood. Right? So not only do we have states like Mississippi where there's one clinic left and it takes hours to drive across the state to get there, we also have states that are trying to close down Planned Parenthood with an argument that someone will step in and take their place. There will be some other clinic that we can fund. Well, first of all, there aren't other clinics. That's and why. they are, they're Catholic. That's true. Um, there aren't other clinics. So we've seen the results in some communities where there's a community in, I think it was Indiana, uh, that they defunded Planned Parenthood, and they now have an HIV epidemic in their community. So we need to be very, very uh, vigilant about making sure that women and men continue to have access to the services that they need and can safely access those services without worrying about the, the legal consequences. Otherwise, they're not going to seek help and we will have all kinds of health consequences. So in terms of, before we get to your questions, and we do want to get to your questions, we wanted to uh, give you some solutions as well now that we've laid out 
a series. The of bad news. news. I know. <laughs> we have the bad news, but we also it's give some of the good news. It's unfortunate, right? We have to have both. We have to have both. Um, so I did a little of uh, joining, actually joining us here today is, are my friends, uh, Carolyn and Dallas Fowler. Carolyn is the... Uh, is, is on our board of the California Democratic Party Women's Caucus as the Southern Chair, and Dallas is a uh, commissioner here in Los Angeles. And uh, Carolyn and I do boot camps, so I wanted to give you a little mini boot camp as part of my solutions for you. So these are my lessons for lawyers in public service. Um, first, we have the five Pelosi P's that we grew up with. As my mom would always say, proper preparation prevents poor performance. So make sure that you are prepared. Study your cases, know what you're talking about, particularly when you're talking about these cultural issues because if people get all up in their feelings, as we are human, we are bound to do, but knowing the facts and knowing what the laws are and being able to take the approach that they're teaching me here at UCLA Law School to take, which is to really analyze how is the law determining or codifying somebody's feelings, somebody's conscience, what somebody's calling their conscience, and where does that religious freedom or conscience begin and end, and where does the greater community interest and liberty, the aggregate liberty, take over? You really have to be prepared and know the facts that you're talking about in these cases, even more so than your typical contracts or real property case. Not that people don't have emotional feelings about contracts and property, you too. Know they do. You know they do. <laughs> yeah. Number two, get to court and go to trial before you get risk averse. Nick, I'm looking at you. So when you all go out there, the time to make your mistakes is early. If you haven't already, get out there. Make sure that you're, you're working for a clinic or if you go to work for a firm, make sure you have a volunteer opportunity to get yourself in the courtroom. Put yourself out there as advocates. Use that legal training early because you know what? If you don't go to trial early, you're never going to go. You'll just One thing will lead to another and you'll talk about the value of settling cases and that'll all be great. But you have this beautiful <laughs> law degree, so get out there and use it early. Uh, be the lawyer or the client, but not both. Empower your clients to tell their stories because the plural of anecdote is not data, but the power of anecdote is demonstration and helping people understand that there is a universality to some of these stories. And by telling some of the, those stories, as, as, as both our speakers have done so eloquently, is very helpful for other people because they'll think, well, I know that case, or I have a friend. I, you were telling your stories, Michelle, and I could think about with the lady I saw with a huge glass of wine and a gigantic belly, and she said, I'm going into labor tomorrow. This is my last hurrah. And I thought, well, Oh, it could like, be her last hurrah. Life. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Different kind of last hurrah. Yes. yes. Use your knowledge as a force for justice and fairness. Make room for others at the leadership table so that it isn't just white women having a conversation about other women or it isn't just privileged women having a conversation about underprivileged women, but really making sure that you, you can't have a legitimate conversation unless everyone's at the table. Go to the barricades and stay out of jail. <laughs> I, I'm on these listservs all the time, and I still visit with Youth Land. Um, as was mentioned, I used to head YDA to share along some of the institutional knowledge. And I see all these people saying, go get yourself arrested. Well, that's all very interesting. But let me tell you, I did. I was a legal observer in law school for the first um, Gulf War. We got arrested anyway uh, at a protest, federal arrest. And I got home, and I had this... Um, voicemail from my mom and she said uh, are you in jail did you miss any classes I don't know why you were in jail but I hope that you know that we're here in Congress trying to try for a peaceful solution so I hope whatever you were doing it was also the peaceful solution that you want to see in the Middle East okay call me back I thought, such a mom right and she, I don't know if she was happier that we were peaceful when we got arrested or that I got out of jail 20 minutes before my contracts class started, so I didn't miss any <laughs> classes that day. But the point is, it, and I've had to mention that arrest every single time I, when, I, when I applied on my moral character exam for the California bar, when I went to the Clinton administration, when I got my security clearance, when I went on Capitol Hill, when I worked even in the public defender's office as an intern, much less before I became a prosecutor, uh, I had to mention it every time. Now I'm proud of it, and I mention it, but 
It's also a federal arrest. So if I get pulled over, it's also not on my rap sheet. If it was a state arrest, it would say 148A in California, resisting arrest. Now, again, I can probably, I'd probably be okay. But what if I were black and there's a police officer that pulls me over, runs my license, and the first thing they learn about me was that I resisted arrest? Is that the time to tell that little story about protesting the war? Would I even get a chance to do that? So think about it. Being at the barricades is very important, but don't get yourself arrested. And if you do get yourself arrested, get arrested before 3 o'clock. Otherwise, you'll have to spend the night in jail. Um, <laughs> they do a shift change. Something that I, I told Congressman John Lewis he was off to get arrested a couple years ago um, against Darfur. And I said, Congressman, you better get yourself in and out of jail before 3 o'clock. We don't want you spending the night there. Um, and he's been arrested how many times? Yeah. Uh, and finally, carry your family streams. How many people here are the first in their generation to go, uh, first generation in their family to go to law school. Wow, that is beautiful. So you think about the dream that you're carrying for your family. I remember I uh, went, when I graduated law school and I passed the bar, luckily on the first try, study really hard, uh, that's all I can tell you. Um, and so I sent that beautiful embossed invitation to my grandmother in Baltimore and she wrote me back and she said, how happy I am to see you accomplish what I could not 50 years ago. Because 50 years before, she had been to night school at University of Maryland. It was before vaccines, some of which, by the way, are developed from fetal tissue. And one of my uncles died. And my grandfather was like, oh, no, you're not going to school. You're going to be home with the rest of the kids. Um, and she never got to graduate, but she always remembered that she had wanted to try. So. When I understood that I was carrying her dream, it made me much more aware of my responsibilities as an activist. So I would say to each of you, the first generations and the second generations who are here, you're carrying the dreams for your family. And you're doing something that literally they dreamed of, perhaps for themselves, but they're living through you. So make sure you make it count. That's powerful. I don't know if I, how That's to follow that did. one. <laughs> I was actually hoping, Michelle, you would tell okay. us about your, the biggest risk you took okay. in law school. Well, yes. Well, on that note, uh, courage truly matters. And I wanted to flag a couple things for you and then tell you about a story of mine in law school. And the first is a quote from Dr. King. And that quote is, of all the forms of inequality, injustice, and in health care is the most shocking and inhumane. Many people uh, don't know this quote from Dr. King. It's in 1966. It's the same year that something else many people don't know, which is that he was one of four who were the first recipients of the Margaret Sanger Award from Planned Parenthood. And he accepted that award with pride. It was actually uh, Coretta Scott King, his wife, who went to the ceremony, he was probably being arrested someplace. But it's very eloquent, uh, his comments. Her comments, too, on the night that she accepted it on his behalf, she said, I would like to say that I am proud to be a woman tonight. But one of the things that he said in his written comments is that if there were aliens who had visited our planet, he said what they would probably see is that we spend billions of dollars on war machines to create death. But he said, our visitors from outer space could be forgiven if they reported home that our planet is inhabited by a race of insane men whose future is bleak and uncertain. And he said that because they were not supporting planned parenting. And that is to say, he made the connection between both the environment our health as a nation, and the health of families as being critically key to how families could plan. He made a specific connection between poor people living in urban cities. He said, how many poor people in urban cities who lack the resources and the means to plan their, their families have children that they're not ready for, that they didn't plan for, and that they cannot afford? It's a beautiful speech, and I commend you all uh, to read it. It's a speech that also shows enormous courage. And so one of the things that I would underscore is the importance of courage. And for me, when I was in law school years ago, um, there was an opportunity to do a fundraiser about AIDS. 
And I thought, well, of course, this should happen. And I was the president of the Black Law Students Association. And I said, well, of course, the Black Law Students Association should be involved with this. And there was a meeting called very swiftly after I had associated uh, the Black Law Students Association with AIDS and HIV. Because at the time, it was thought of as a gay disease. And there were folks that said, you can't do this. How dare you associate the Black Law Students Association with AIDS and HIV and all of that? And I said, all right, fine. You sort of drop the microphone moment. Um, I will do this anyway. And I remember thinking at the time, oh, what you don't see. Oh, what you don't know. Oh, what you can't appreciate right now. Because you know what? AIDS is the number one killer of black women between the ages of 25 and 34. African American teenagers are 17 times more likely to contract HIV and AIDS. It is a killer in our communities. And if only there were others who could see. And so I encourage you to stay steadfast, have courage, have a vision, follow through. When you see obstacles in your way, those obstacles can be overcome. You don't necessarily always need an organization uh, behind your name to get something done. It's helpful when you do. Uh, but very often, those organizations can sometimes pull you down, too. And I have to say, I love Black Law Students Associations. <laughs> but I'm saying in that moment, there can be folks who actually lose sight of, of humanity. So you're probably thinking that you know what the riskiest thing I did during law school was. <laughs> and I have news for you, you don't. Uh, I think the riskiest thing I did during law school was that I was part of a small group of students who helped to serve a subpoena on a Latin American dictator who had been asked to speak uh, and teach a course on campus. And after the student who actually touched him with the papers um, was uh, threatened with an assault case, Trust me, we, we realized the risks of, of having participated in that action. So um, be at the barricades, but be careful. Um, so with that segue, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that I wanted to, to think back to was one of the weaknesses of Griswold and of where we are today as a result. Um, so Griswold is all about privacy. And privacy is a very narrow frame. Right? It's about being left alone. It, it's almost sort of a, a libertarian type of view. And it does nothing for someone who doesn't have the resources that they need. It leaves them out there in their cold, by themselves, left alone. Right? It's a very private frame. So as a result, now 50 years later, we don't have a constitutional right to access to the health care that we require whether that's reproductive health care or, or other types of assistance. So one of the things that has happened in the decades since is that, and I have to give credit to uh, black women and women of color who led this fight, um, that's right, is reframing this as a reproductive justice issue rather than a reproductive rights issue. Um, and do we have law students for reproductive justice in the house? Excellent. Um, so reproductive justice is defined much more broadly than rights and than privacy. Uh, it's about making sure that you actually have the, the ability free from constraint to decide about the size and timing of your, your family and to be able to keep your family safe and healthy. Uh, so it means things like having a right to that access to health care and to being able to afford it and to being able to actually get to the clinic. Um, the types of justice issues that we're, we're now really facing. I think that provides us a way forward is thinking in those kinds of terms. And that it's not just about contraception and abortion, right? Mm -hmm. That when we begin to understand that uh, reproductive justice really is about when do I schedule it? How do I have a pregnancy without being tortured by the state, literally, without mm -hmm. being forcibly probed uh, by the state? How do I have a pregnancy where the moment that I become pregnant, I lose all of my rights, I lose basic fundamental freedoms, including privacy, because my doctor can suddenly inform anybody, including law enforcement, about the status of my pregnancy. And these are some very important questions that we must see as our questions, too, and not just those of poor women. And reproductive justice also has a heavy emphasis on intersectionality 
on thinking about things in the lens of, well, what would this be like for an immigrant? What would this be like for a person of color, for a person of a variety of religious backgrounds, for a gay person, for a man? Not just in a lens of, well, reproductive rights are a women's issue and women are defined as straight white privileged women. Um, so if we look at that kind of intersectionality, we see that reproductive justice issues include things like working in a nail salon where the chemicals that you're exposed to mean that you have reproductive challenges in the future, or being deployed into a war zone and having an injury that means you have reproductive challenges when you come home, but you don't have any access to that kind of health care as a veteran. So there's a, a whole range of issues that really do intersect in this reproductive justice frame, and that opens up a way for us to not only be more just and equitable in what we're fighting for, but to bring in a lot of our allies into the fight and to expand who's in this room so that we're all standing together and fighting together for the same type of justice. And so before we take your questions, let me read you a little memo that we got today in the news from the Conservative Action Progress, co-founded by former Republican Attorney General Ed Meese. Everybody remember Ed Meese? Ronald Reagan? They're okay. too young to remember Ed Meese. Ah, but you have to study him. <laughs> Here's what you need to know. I'm too the young to remember The next president is likely to appoint as many as three justices to the U.S. Supreme Court, establishing a new majority and shaping the judicial branch for a generation. Those justices will serve for many years after the next president leaves office and their votes will impact every facet of American life. Will the next president select justices who abide by the text and original meaning of the Constitution, even when doing so is politically unpopular or inconvenient? Or will our system of checks and balances be further damaged by the selection of justices who take for themselves the power to rewrite the Constitution according to their own political preferences? Sadly, despite three Republican presidencies, and seven appointments to the court in the last 35 years, we still have a court that too frequently does the latter. So that's throwing the gauntlet down. That's a conservative group that's just announced that they're going to be raising tens of millions of dollars in the next presidential election based on the court. It's all about the justices, so they can look like those three ladies over there um, or vastly different. And the, the choices that they make will impact the choices that we have. So a final plug, not only to do all your good legal work and with distinction, but make sure your voices are also vote. heard in the presidential campaign and make sure that you vote. With that, we welcome your questions. Yes. yes. So I'm not having catechism with them. I was just with my parish priest. It, he was resplendent, so excited to be at the Capitol last week visiting with, well, we all got to see the Pope come to Washington. And I think if you look at what Pope Francis is talking about, he hasn't changed the catechism one bit. My cousins and my uncle who were there are as pro-life as the friends you're talking about. So we don't talk about the catechism and we don't talk about whether it's um, killing babies as some people are shrieking at us, but neither am I, you know, you're not gonna have a conversation with someone who in the very earliest days of Black Lives Matter was saying to us, um, I think it might've been after my very first tweet of Black Lives Matter, someone jumped on in, well, not for you, you're for abortion, right? I mean, like that's just, 
you're not going to have, that's not where the debate is. I think the debate is centered on more on maternal health. And if you are pro-life, and then what are we going to do about the life of the mother and the options for the child once the child is born? But my advice is not to have a conversation about something that you know you start off disagreeing with, but try to find points of common ground where you can agree. And Michelle, I believe you have a little bit of a scorecard to share well, with us on that topic. Yes. Topics. Well, in fact, um, on November the 6th in Washington, D.C. at the National Press Club, we'll be holding hearings. And one of the things that we'll be releasing there uh, will be a report card. And that is we're very interested in evaluating how well are politicians doing, how are states doing, so that one of the things that you find, those that are even the most pro-life, what I'm hitting home is, how are you de dealing with keeping women alive during their pregnancies and keeping their babies alive? It turns out they're doing horribly. So even on the, the one thing that they say they want so much, you find that in the most red states are where women are most in danger of actually dying in their pregnancies and their babies too. If they really care about women and they care about their babies, they would be doing a far better job of not only ensuring the health and life of those women and the babies that are born, but they would also be paying attention to the other reproductive justice issues and making sure that women aren't being shackled during their pregnancies and women aren't birthing babies in toilets and on cement floors in prisons and jails. And that's a whole different discussion that we didn't fully get into. And we also There's... want to look at things like sex education um, in schools too. How are these politicians doing on that scorecard too? And there's a list of, of other issues. There's been a, a good bit of research done recently by groups like NARAL and Planned Parenthood about how to communicate around these issues because they're difficult to talk about first of all, and they're an area where people have very deeply held and entrenched beliefs, um, and yelling at each other has not been working for a few decades now. Um, so what they found was some really interesting things. Number one, um, especially young people and people in communities of color don't see themselves in the pro-life, pro-choice lens. Those terms that we all use in political conversation, that just doesn't reflect where people view themselves. And some of the, the comments that they gave in the research were things like, well, I'm not pro-choice. I just think that everyone should make the decision for themselves. <laughs> to those of us who think of pro-choice as meaning everyone should make their own decision, that seems like a really nonsensical sentence. But it just points out that these labels aren't working. They're just dividing people. And so what we need to do is start talking about things like, well, I'm not walking in her shoes, so I don't know her circumstances, her situation. That's her decision to make. Those types of constructs are much more helpful in talking to the public and talking to someone that you don't necessarily agree with about this. I think they absolutely have that right, and as a former rape prosecutor, I think they also have the right to make sure that their assailant is prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law without them being re-victimized by the system, as has happens too often. I mean, first being violated by an intimate partner or, or a stranger, and then being victimized uh, by the system. But I absolutely think that, uh, and. Eight out of 10 Americans agree with me, according to uh, even the most conservative polling, that in the cases of rape or incest, women should have access, uh, full access to abortion. Which, f frankly, for, for a room full of law students and, and lawyers, I can get into this. Think about that. Most Americans agree that abortion should be legal and accessible in cases of rape, incest, or, uh, well, let's start with those two. Okay, because the other one's a little bit more complicated, but rape and incest. So when we're having conversations about how we have to protect what some folks see as an unborn child and that that life is the center of the conversation, why does it make a difference 
if it was rape or incest. What this shows is that clearly, for most Americans, they're actually getting into judgments about the woman's behavior or actions and whether or not she's at fault here. So I think you can, you can draw a whole series of conclusions from that. Some of our current presidential candidates have drawn the conclusion that abortion should not be accessible even in cases of rape and incest. That's not the direction I would go, personally, <laughs> um, or as political advice, frankly. Um, but I think for those of us who think really deeply about this issue, it indicates that this is hard and people have different moral lines about what is acceptable behavior and what isn't, and that's why the law shouldn't be getting into this question. There's one point that I'd like to add to that uh, that's about voting and the importance of voting. Um, women comprise only 20% of our federal electorate. Uh, that's staggering. In the entire history of our Senate, there have only been 35 women in the entire history of it. 20 of them now. It's not surprising to me, and it won't be to you, that people, in fact, expand their views of things with the greater diversity around them, right? So we need to vote. We need to elect more people to office who understand these issues, who, who understand the stories and actually hear the stories. I'll tell you, that in my family, we're a blended interracial family. And for my husband, who comes from the state of Ohio, one of those states that we know is our swing state, and was raised in a family um, that were big Nixon supporters, um, I would have to say that the eyes of that family has been, has been you know, have been intensely opened mm -hmm. um, by the fact of the diversity within their family. It just happens. You come to know people. You come to understand their stories. You come to see what they experience. Uh, and we need to bring our electorate to come to understand the stories of women. And unless we do better in voting and electing uh, women to office, that's not going to happen. So true. You can only look at the difference, for example, in the Violence Against Women Act. The first time it was written by Joe Biden. We love him for writing that. And that that was great. But when it was reauthorized, the lead person on it for the House Democrats was Gwen Moore, an African-American woman uh, who told and a rape the story survivor. of her rape on the floor of the House of Representatives and was very, very clear about uh, it was a close friend of the family, apropos of your other conversation, and she was a virgin at the time. And there were all of these other uh, elements to her story, but one of the things that she and I have actually talked about, and I just think it's important for us as law students and law scholars to remember is we have to stop the quest for the perfect victim. Yes. Right? Because that is going to cloud our judgment as to what the law should be. Uh, we have this in AIDS. Remember they were innocent victims of AIDS? And we said, no, they're people with AIDS. Yeah. So you have, I think you have to take people as they are, not as you would exactly. like them to be, and take the choice that you would make for the most revered victim, the person that you love the most. Now imagine them making a decision and how you would feel about supporting them and then expand that to everybody. That's how I define uh, pro-choice for myself. Yes, ma'am. So for those of us who've been following these issues for a long time, I'm really curious about your political diagnosis. This needs to be the following. Bad. <laughs> So uh, I've thought about this one a good bit. Um, I think one thing we have to notice is that we are at different points in the cycle of these two movements, right? So some folks would argue that where we are for gay rights is 1973 for reproductive rights when we had just achieved Roe, right? And that hopefully we'll not see that kind of backlash to gay rights. So some people see some trends there. I think there are holes in that theory, but... Um, cycles go in different, movements go in different cycles and, and different patterns. Um, and I think there are different kinds of forces at work in the two questions. That said, I think that there is a lesson that reproductive justice advocates can take from the gay rights movement. So if you look at some of the data on what has truly made a difference in recent years, 
it's personal stories. It's knowing someone. I mean, how many members of Congress have reversed their position on gay marriage because their son came out to them, right? Like, there are multiple of those. That's that's what makes the difference. It's someone in your own life who you can relate to rather than a stereotype, right? So the problem, one of the problems I think we have right now in the reproductive justice movement, at least when we're talking about abortion, but even other reproductive health care access, is that what comes to mind is folks is the stereotype because they don't know who among their friends and family members has needed to have an abortion or has had some of these other reproductive justice uh, types of concerns. And the reason they don't know that is that we all keep it very private, right? So coming back to one of the other problems with the privacy lens of Griswold is if we don't talk about our experiences, then stereotypes and misinformation is allowed to control the public dialogue. Now that said, I, I want to be clear that these are very difficult personal experiences that not everyone can talk about. It sometimes involves trauma and violence. And we have to respect each other's rights to talk about these in safe ways and when we can and when it's right for us. And legally, that has to be the case. But those of us who are at a point where we're ready to start having those conversations, we need to have those conversations, we need to amplify those conversations, because the public as a, as a whole is not going to understand these experiences until they've heard the personal stories. Yeah. You know, I, I concur with, with so much of that. Um, these are situations where, I, well, first I would say that it's, it's daunting, and I would reiterate that we've lost part of the battle because we weren't there at the forefront. We didn't see the concerns and issues that were facing poor women and women of color as the kinds of issues that are central to the debates in this regard. And I think that um, we had a lot of slippage there when there were a lot of economic resources where we could have been fighting those battles and uh, right there alongside uh, these women. I think that we can't ignore the political power context uh, of this uh, either, uh, that this is a time in which not only with regard to the rights for women, but also rights uh, with people of color are also being challenged, where there's gerrymandering that's taking place, uh, where there are attempts to block votes, uh, where there are a, a, attempts to, um, very explicit attempts at times of elections to keep people from being able to exercise a clear right to vote. So I think that there is also a power dynamic uh, within the context of this that we also have to be quite mindful about. And then I think there's also something else that, that's, you know, and I don't know where you all might um, sit with this, that some have said, you know, look, you know, much of the way in which the marriage movement has been framed as, as, as male issue. I mean, clearly there are women who also are being privileged by, um, this, um, by the rights that have been granted for marriage, um, but it's men doing the work for men. Um, and, you know, some people are persuaded by that argument. I think that there is something in that, um, but I would say that as well we, we are sort of lacking because um, the sort of question of the familiar is really gone in all of this. And the final thing that I would say is that we've been so successful in this domain that we've forgotten about women dying in streets. We've forgotten about the fact that women were literally bleeding out in bathtubs, uh, that women were dying when they got to hospitals. We've forgotten that there were young women who were committing suicide on college campuses um, out of the shame of a pregnancy or because they believed that there would be no way for them to be able to have a life after pregnancy, the life that they want. Because we're so far away from that, We've forgotten that that exists, that that is right on the other side of this. And I think that if we came better to understand what's on the other side, it might move the agenda in just a little bit more. Remember, Karen, remember when we had the female Prop 8 plaintiffs came to the California Democratic Party Women's Caucus and they told us how the men were quite dominant in all the discussions. And they say, wait, you know, we the plaintiffs are female here. How about us? So I think that there's... Uh, the short answer is rich white men wanted to get married. Uh, the longer answer is, is what you heard. But let's be real. Uh, 25 years ago, the argument was if you went, if the, if the gay rights movement, and it was considered the gay rights movement, now the LGBT movement, but 
Um, if you crack the two codes, the two institutions of marriage and the military, then you could open up to housing and employment. Other people said, well, far more people need housing and jobs than are ever going to serve in the military and that even want to get married. But in terms of where the resources went, in terms of where the politics went, it went towards military and marriage. So our hope now is to take some of the momentum from marriage and turn it out into housing and employment. Because you, if you get married on Sunday and you get fired on Monday, um, then you don't really have the right to get married. And it goes back to what, um, what has been said, which is if you make it more intersectional and realize that everyone's pushing together. That's one thing that we really tried to do. I say we, I work with a firm, in a firm called Democracy Partners, and we were working on the amicus briefs for um, the Voting Rights Act and for marriage equality. We tried to make sure that all the outside groups were on both amicus briefs so that people saw, you know, that, that first of all, the people who are fighting and dying for voting rights were fighting and dying for every single right from which voting rights flow. So that solidarity really is important and so even when you're looking at your cases or you're looking at the amicus briefs that are filed this year, starting this first Monday in October, look to see who's signing on and look to see if you have an intersectional coalition. And if not, ask the question. If you're engaged with a group and they're not signing on, ask them why not and push them to do that. Oh, sorry, last question. Someone who hasn't asked a question before? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, campaign and th there was a lot of backlash. I think it meant to me, like shout your life or something. And is that what you were, is that something that you like, just thought was a good idea? What are your thoughts on that? And then also, what do you, what kind of other strategies do you have moving forward for the abortion is an every woman thing? Um, so the, the shout your abortion uh, campaign uh, essentially was women talking about their abortion online. So I think that is one piece of what I'm talking about. Uh, the one thing I will say is that can, can I pretend I'm part of the same generation? Can we do that for like, okay, um, thank you. Um, so uh, as millennials, we tend to go immediately to the online space. Be aware that the online space is one of the worst places in the world for women in terms of the, the types of hate speech and attacks that we get back because it's anonymous for, for lots of reasons. So just think critically about whether or not that's the first place that we wanna go with this type of work. But frankly, so much can be accomplished by just talking to people you know it doesn't have to be you know, giving a speech to the law school or, or a big online campaign. It can just be person to person. All of the, the research on how people vote in elections, how people are convinced on different issues, is that they have to find a trusted messenger. And for most people, that's their friends and family. So that's actually the most effective thing we can do is just talk to people we know about what our experiences have been. It's also possibly the hardest thing we can do. Um, so it, it's a lot. Thank you. Thank you to the American Constitution Society. Yeah, we can do a group photo. Thank you to the American Constitution Society. Thank all of you for coming. We really appreciate it.